In astronomy, having a good telescope is half the battle. You need to have some way of recording the information the telescope gathers. And that basically comes down to two types of detectors or instruments that we commonly place upon telescopes. So this is the uh, high acuity wide field K-band imager or Hawk 1. It's basically a giant camera and it's attached to the side of a telescope at the European Southern Observatory. So as you can see, these instruments can get to be very large and very sophisticated. But let's talk about the most basic instrument of all, the human eye. In fact, the eye can be thought of as a miniature telescope and detector all in one. Uh, so there's an aperture that's defined by the pupil. There's a lens that refracts light, and that light is then concentrated onto the back of our detector, which is simply the retina of the eye. And that information is read out along the optic nerve into the brain, and the brain has software to build up an image of whatever the eye is detecting. Now, the eye can collect information for about 100 milliseconds. Uh, this is something known as the integration time. It's the amount of time the eye, in this case, can spend collecting data before it reads it out along the optic nerve to the brain. But the eye also has a rather low, what's called quantum efficiency. And that means that about three or 30% of all of the photons falling into the eye are actually captured on the retina and read out to the brain. So think about that for a minute. We are missing 70 to 97% of all of the light that we are supposed to be seeing. So clearly using the eyeball and a good drawing was the only way to record anything in the sky until the 1800s when John W. Draper captured the very first astrophoto and he was using glass plates which were commonly used in photography at the time and there were several advantages to glass plates over the human eye uh, number one you could have very long integration times and this meant that you could gather light on very very faint objects not just faint stars but also faint fuzzy objects like these nebulae that you see here are regions of what are called low surface brightness the photographic plates have several disadvantages, uh, not the least of which is the fact that they have a low quantum efficiency. So if you needed to capture something that was particularly dim and faint, it meant that you would have to spend literally the entire night at the telescope taking an exposure. And you better hope that you don't make any mistakes because as you know, if you were to make a mistake and say, move the telescope into the wrong direction, you've ruined your exposure and you would have to start all over again. Or if you were in the middle of a very long exposure, you may have to wait until the following night. And even then, you may have to wait even longer if it gets cloudy. Photographic plates are also single use. Today, we take it for granted that we could take as many pictures as we want with our phones over and over and over again. But back in these days, you were stuck with a single use plate. And that meant that once your exposure was complete, you had to remove the plate from the camera and put it in a vault someplace, and then pick up another glass plate, insert it into your camera, and get started. Uh, this also meant that there were no backups either, which was another major problem. Oh, and they were only sensitive to visual light. So if you wanted to do anything outside of the visible part of the spectrum, you were out of luck. Plates also had a non-linear response, and what this means is that if you were to say double your exposure time, you would not gather twice the light. You might only gather maybe 25% more light or maybe 15% more light or less percentage of the light over time. And finally, glass breaks. So if you broke a plate, there goes your data. You have to take another image some other time. So in the 1970s, the charged couple device, or CCD, was introduced. And if you're not familiar with CCDs, just take a look at your phone. You use them when you take images, any digital images recorded on a charged couple device. And they have several advantages over photographic plates. First of all, they are linear response. In other words, if you double the integration time or if you double the exposure time, you get double the photons. 
and you can achieve a very high quantum efficiency. In other words, you can capture up to 90% of the light that falls onto the CCD. Now, since the CCD is by definition digital, that means that you can just read out the data and use the same CCD over and over and over again. Uh, there's no removal of the CCDs to process the images. You just read them out and take another exposure. Best thing about CCDs is that they're sensitive at all wavelengths. So now, infrared astronomy, ultraviolet astronomy, even radio astronomy, and gamma ray astronomy are all possible thanks to the emergence of the CCD. And just as we saw before with photographic plates, not only can we capture images with CCDs, but we can capture highly detailed spectra. And because of the digital nature of CCDs, we can not only identify the wavelengths at which absorption lines occur, but we can also measure how deep or how strong those absorption lines are. Now, if you take an image with a CCD at a telescope, you might be surprised to find that they all come back in black and white, regardless of the color that you're photographing in. Why is that? Well, in astronomy, we are looking at very, very faint objects, which means that we want to capture every single photon that we can. Our phones, on the other hand, typically photograph bright objects, people in a room, the cat, so forth. So they can use red, green, and blue CCD pixels to capture those colors simultaneously and process them together on the fly. In astronomy, though, we're dealing with very faint objects, so we just want to capture all of the light at those particular wavelengths, and then we just add the colors in later. And then we could take all of these colors and then combine them into a full color image like the one shown here. So when you are looking at a beautiful photograph taken from the Hubble Space Telescope or any other telescope, just make sure you read the caption because you need to understand whether or not you are looking at a natural color image, that is a red, green, and blue image combined together, or if we are using representative colors to represent infrared or ultraviolet wavelengths. So a question I always get asked is, are these colors real? And I, my answer is, Yes, they're very real, it's just that they may not be representing the colors that you think they are. So it pays to read the fine print.